Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Escaping Atheism Podcast with Max Colbe. Please give us a like. Please give us a subscribe. Please remember we need your financial support. Uh, joining me today, I'm actually going to have an informal conversation, and we'll see if you guys enjoy it, with James Bishop. James Bishop is, uh, uh, I believe, a, he is a Christian apologist, which is not what we do on Escaping Atheism. Uh, as I've mentioned to everybody, we defend other religions besides Christianity here, and um, we have lots of people on our team who are uh, not Christian. Uh, but uh, in any case, this is James Bishop's blog. I'm flashing it on the screen now, James Bishop's Theological Rationalism, which you'll find on jamesbishopblog.com. I notice he's got a lot of stuff on here. Uh, I, I see that what you mostly do, James, is interviews of people... Uh, well, is, is interviews, right? What kind of people do you interview? Well, you mean like more in terms of testimonies and that sort of stuff. Like yeah, I mean, is that, really... Yeah, is that basically what you do is testimonies of people who yeah. came to Christianity in particular? Yeah, uh, often mostly from like atheism, uh, but then other stuff too, like Islam and New Age and that sort of thing. So people who yeah. come to Christianity from a variety of points of view, other religions, uh, well, these days atheism yeah. is a religion. I don't know how you deny it, but I get what yeah. you're saying. What, what, what got you interested in, 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 well, apparently you would think of what you do as Christian apologetics. So what got you, but what got you interested in this particular project, talking to people who left other, other faiths? In terms of like the testimonies and that sort of thing, um, I just found like people really like stories and I found that uh, sort of testimonies of like, like sort of high profile sort of academics who end up uh, sort of coming to faith uh, from atheism or from any other sort of belief system, but mostly atheism for now, um, actually makes a good story. And I think people already like just judging by st statistics from my blog site, like uh, people enjoy testimonies. So. I try to emphasize that a bit more. Um, yeah, personal stories really get really uh, seem to resonate with people. Yeah, uh, the, you know, you're South African, right? Yeah, I'm from South Africa. So you're calling us from South Africa. That's cool. Um, were you always religious? Hey, was I always? Yeah, were you always religious? Did, were you always a Christian? Well, were you always religious? Um, were you always? Uh, um, well, I was brought up religious, like in a sort of Christian home when I was uh, maybe between 6 and 12. Um, and I went to church and stuff, but eventually I ended up rejecting sort of Christianity. And I never I never strictly became like an atheist. Like I know you were an atheist, um, yeah. but like for me it was more like anti-religion sort of thing. And I came back to faith about four years ago when I was 20. Um, oh, you're, yeah. you're only 24. That's interesting. Yeah. How, how old are you? I'm 51. And, oh. and, and, and I, I lost my atheism at approximately the age of 41 or 42. Oh, wow. That's, that's not so long ago. Well, well yeah, about, about, about a decade, more or less. Yeah, yeah. Um, and oh, my, oh, dear God, I'm glad I'm not an atheist anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna ask, like, why? So, what, what made you sort of change or transition? Yeah, I, I just had a conversation with somebody. Well, I, I seem to be having this conversation a lot lately, but that's okay. What made me change? Well, there's that's the interesting thing. I mean, I literally had gone for most of my life just uh, not really seeing any evidence or any reason to believe there was a god at all. Yeah. And uh, uh, I was raised in an evangelical and Protestant home. Uh, it's, it was a chaotic environment I grew up in, however. There was divorce. There was, there was a lot. It was actually what you'd call an abusive background, quite much so, actually. Um, and, you know, the first time I was uh, <clears throat> uh, exposed to religion, I'm, I can never remember for clear, right, because it was so long ago. It was roughly the age of eight or nine. Yeah, you know, probably roughly around well, maybe closer to ten even, but I mean, right in there. Let's call it nine, age nine. Uh, suddenly, the family decided to get religious on both sides, and of course, different religions. My dad's from my mom's. Uh, I had reached a point in my life that I no longer believed anything, 
or anyone unless I could verify it for myself. And that is at a child's age, right? Because, uh, you know, to make a long story short, I don't want to bereave you, I, I learned that I could not trust any single person I knew as a child what they told me was true. Yeah. And so therefore, I developed an attitude as a child at a very early age that I wouldn't believe anything unless I could prove it to myself. And now, in reality, that is a terrible way to live your life, and you will almost certainly ruin yourself if you decide you're not going to believe anything until you can personally verify it. That's actually an impossible way to live. I mean, it's completely – and you will go insane. Um, yeah. and, and, and especially when, you know, your own rationality and your own reason, you can reason your way into anything. And if you've got no moral, ethical, or intellectual thing that you recognize outside of yourself as like your touchstone, yeah. and you're just relying on other people all the time or your own instincts to tell you what's right and wrong, mate, you're gonna mess some, you're gonna mess your life up and other people's. And I had a very chaotic life for the longest time, um, yeah. which I, mean, I can now like, look. Huh? I mean, it sounds quite a long time. You said you were from age ten to about forty-one. Well, I mean, I didn't give it up and totally reject the faith until, or reject the spiritual. I, I, I rejected Christianity firmly and completely by the age of maybe 15. Yeah. Uh, 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 I, I still dabbled around uh, playing with New Age stuff, occultism, yeah. you know, astrology, reincarnation, Edgar Cayce, UFOs. And it was all, but it was all out of curiosity. Yeah. It wasn't like I was uh, utterly fascinated with any of it. I, I, I wasn't. I was curious about it. And I, I, you know, I'm putting all things spiritual, supernatural, whatever, into this just one giant box, right? So Jesus right next to astrology. What was the difference? Yeah. Why would, right? Um, and, yeah, I mean, I just eventually, I think it was probably Penn Jillette who talked me into just saying, you know what, screw it, I don't believe any of this crap. Penn Jillette and James Randi and guys like those. Um, also some early Richard Dawkins, but that would have been before uh, the God delusion. That would have been like in the 90s. Uh, he was already doing atheist stuff. And I mean, it was either Penn Jillette or Dawkins who said, you know what, screw this. You know, you don't really believe any of it. You're an atheist until they prove otherwise. And so... I guess you'd say I've vacillated between an open-minded agnostic and a grumpy, impatient atheist for maybe 30 years. Yo, that's, that's a long time, man. Yo. Well, it is. And, you know, one of the things I've discovered is if you're an atheist and you're in some kind of profession where you can have a stable career and family and success because maybe you're a college professor or something, yeah. it's easier to stay atheist. Um, yeah. But it's hard even for those people. You know, yeah. uh, a lot of us as we age. And I, I had begun questioning. And what what actually got me questioning, again, was negative experiences with atheists. I mean, straight up. I had always, you know, had friends who were not religious. I had always had friends who were, I had other atheist friends, but I didn't particularly go out of my way to hang with other atheists. It, 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 I didn't feel a bonding experience over my atheism. I just didn't have an intellectual whatever, like, why would you? And, 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 and I guess, so that does make me different from a lot of young atheists I say, see today, because they shock me by how aggressively uninformed they are. Yeah. Uh, I was never like that. I was wandering around. I'm an atheist. I don't really believe this. Maybe it even suited my own narcissism, because I assumed I was just a little smarter and more insightful than most people which yeah. is a, a narcissistic thing most atheists have. But, uh, I mean, I knew so many people with so many loopy beliefs, whether it was astrology, reincarnation, crystal healing, yo, you know, UFOs. Oh, this one's the fundamentalist Christian. Oh, look, there goes a Jew. It's like, well, this is just a trait of the human species. And, uh, and so when I was an atheist, actually, I was always nice to religious people. Yeah. Unless it was a certain type of Christian who won't leave you alone. Right, yeah. or was threatening you with hellfire, and I, I ran from those guys because I didn't like them. Um, but otherwise, it was just you know when holidays would come around, I'd say, "Well, how Merry Christmas! I hope you have a good holy day for yourself." You know, I, I was never sarcastic. I was never nasty about it. 
Yeah. Um, uh, and I would talk to religious friends. And I took a couple of comparative religion courses, would read a book now and then, in between all the science books I was reading. Yeah. Uh, so I was a big science guy, which is a real common atheist trait, I've noticed, uh, these days anyway. And the bad behavior by atheists just hit me really hard. I was actually mobbed by a group of my fellow atheists online, a very, a very early variant of what you'd call a cyber mob, um, by some somewhat famous atheists like P.Z. Myers and a few of those. I'd had some opinions they didn't like, and I had crossed the party line. Actually, I can tell you what, I, what, what specifically set them off and caused them to atheists swarming in groups in rage at me um, was somehow the creationist, well, the, the creationist debate had started up and gotten popular again. This would have been more than 10 years ago, maybe more like 50, I don't know, more, more than 10 years ago. And there did seem to be this huge hysterical push over uh, warning stickers that evolution, I think it was warning stickers that evolution is just a theory on, on school textbooks in Texas or something like that. And I remember even at the time, I'm an atheist, I know science real well, I know evolution really well, I know a bunch of other stuff. I said, you know what, guys, if you understand science, you realize they are correct to say evolution is just a theory. I mean, it's an awfully good theory, it's a well-tested theory, but they are correct that it's just a theory. Yeah. Because you can't, and, and they'll get mad when you say just a theory, and I said, well, no, it is still a theory. No matter what you want, to, it's still a theory, and people are always allowed to question a theory. And they started yeah. screaming that, no, you're not allowed to question this theory because it's a fact, and you don't understand what a theory is. It's a fact. It's a fact. I said, well, I know what a theory is. I've studied, I, I know scientists. I've studied science. It is still a theory. You, you can't ever declare a theory a fact. It can't be done. Yeah. And, and they got angry with me, and they got angrier and angrier because I also said, listen, this fight over creation is you're making it worse, right? I mean, I even know other Christians think this is a pointless argument. Why are you doing it? And they just amped up the hype and were after me like a horde of demons because I just would not concede the creationism was a crushing threat to us all. Yeah. And, and they were viciously mean, too. I mean, really mean, and accusing me of things I didn't say and accusing me of a hidden agenda. And I'm like, Everything I'm saying is psychological, is, you know, theologically, well, I didn't, wasn't even theology. Everything I'm saying is scientifically correct. And, the, and that experience, and they began smearing me and bad-mouthing me on other things. I'm like, all right. I don't believe there's a God. I don't think. But I think there may be something wrong with atheism. Yep. This is literally what I thought. I, there, there must be something wrong. And, and I guess, unlike some atheists, uh, especially today, uh, I always said, you know what, I may just be missing something, people, right? I mean, I still had the firm skeptics, well, cross, you know, cross your arms, well, go ahead, show me your evidence. But I was, I just, I don't know how to explain that. I don't know what's happened to so many young atheists. In honesty, even on the Escaping Atheism Project, if I just get an atheist to be a smarter and more thoughtful atheist, to me, that's a win. <laughs> but, although, just to tell you in reality, I don't know if I'd want to print this or not, because I try, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I'll, I'll just go ahead. I've had all kinds of people convert yeah. uh, by nothing. Now, I'll give it to you, too. By nothing, but talking about how dumb and irrational and squirrely weird atheism is, uh, which is an insight. I, th I don't know if a lot of people have had it yet, or they've had it, but they haven't really wrapped their head around the fact um, that it really is abnormal to be an atheist, especially an atheist as we see the typical one in the English-speaking world circa 2017. Like 30 years ago, you know, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, when I was around, you know, a teenager, there were always atheists around. I was one of them. We were always a minority, uh, and there was no problem. I mean, there just simply wasn't. Yet there's this terrible narrative out there now that uh, prior to, I don't know, the new atheist explosion 10 years ago, 
that atheists were just routinely vilified, beaten, mocked, imprisoned, tortured, and treated like garbage by contemporary society. And, dude, I was born in 1966 in the Bible Belt, and I never saw anything like these fantasies they have. Um, so, the, the, you know, I mean, it, it, it was a little weird if you just went around and said, I'm an atheist. That might cause some people, but if I just said, you know what, I'm not religious. No, I don't think I don't think I believe that stuff. Sorry, I'm not interested. Ninety-nine out of a hundred religious people would just leave me alone. Um, and and what I see among the young today is there that it's it's completely inverted. They they think that not believing in God makes you smart, makes you an expert in science, makes you logical makes you able apparently they often seem to even think they have magical they have they have been granted powers of psychology and could give psychological diagnoses to everything or anything they see yeah uh it's it's become what uh, you know it's a fad but it is a cult movement and this this is the other thing that i can't get through to people now i don't know what you see in south africa but I know what you can see in Canada, the United States, the UK, other places like that. You know, there's these atheist clubs. There's atheist forums all over the Internet. There's atheist recruiters. I've talked to them. You know, sometimes they don't admit they're recruiters, but you can usually fish them out once you learn the atheist recruitment talking points. And those exist. I'll give you references if you want them. Yeah. Uh, and, and my biggest insight, and this is an insight I had about two years ago, and uh, since I had it and began, you know, talking about it and writing about it, it's really true. Atheism is a cult movement. And I'm going to repeat that. Cult. C-U-L-T. They're a cult. Movement. Yeah. I mean, they're, they're probably more better, and, and this is why you'll see we always use the capital A for atheism, unless what we like to do is, like, if it's a... You know, we really do think there's two types of atheists. There's a natural atheist who just doesn't get it and is kind of hostile or he's got emotional issues or he's got a mental block or he's just not interested. There's that atheist. And then there's the people who get picked up by the club, but by the cult movement. Because the cult movement we use the capital A on, A for capital atheist. And, what, and once it snaps into you that there is such a cult movement, you start to see it everywhere. They got badges. They got symbols. They got several varieties of symbols. They've got slogans. They got taglines. They got conversion materials. They got recruiting materials. They've got clubs you join. They've got places you go. They've got online uh, uh, forums everywhere. And very similar and very predictable talking points they use on almost everything. Mm -hmm. And because I'd always, even when I was an atheist, I, I was always interested in religion. And I remember. You know, because it was just part of the human world. That's the thing that bothers me about so many atheists today, young atheists especially. It's like, even though I didn't believe in it, but I'm like, well, this is normal human behavior, this spiritual stuff. So I would, you know, occasionally reinvestigate it. And I, I had read a book on cults because I was like, well, what distinguishes a cult from a real religion? And I found this book written by a couple of psychiatrists called Snapping, where they detailed what makes a cult. Yeah, I was going to ask you what what how would you define a cult? Well, in, in fact, I will flash this. Up. I will flash this up. You know, it's interesting. Interest in the phenomenon of cults has waned in the last 10, 10 20 years. Uh, they they used to be more people used to be more curious about them, and I actually think that's because culturally we've accepted the lie that all religions and cults and all culture are religions, and uh, that's garbage. Um, that's that that's playing games. A book I would recommend, even though it's older, it's still very good. Uh, I'm snap flashing it on the screen now. Uh, snapping, America's Epidemic of Sudden Personality Change. Although I think you will see if you read that, it doesn't matter what country you're actually from. Uh, because they do, you know, a scientific psychological analysis of various known cults and how they do it. And, and, and the, big, the big identifier of a cult rather than religion there's a few, but usually the cult has to have a, a, a person, usually one person or maybe a small clique of group who has complete control. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you're immediately thinking like Catholics in their pope, it's like, no, 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 no. If you know anything about Catholics in their pope, yeah. people argue with the pope, people call them, you know, 
you know, a lot of people don't, whoever's Pope, there's lots of Catholics don't like him at any given moment, right? Um, it doesn't work like that. But in a cult, there's usually one individual or very few, and their word is God's word, as far as everybody's concerned, all the time. And the cult wants, wants most of your money, uh, most of your time, uh, and wants to control pretty much every aspect of your life. And they're also well known for doing things like, oh, look, there's a deviant within the cult. We need to either break him back into the fold or we need to eject him forever and shun him so he loses all his family and friends and all that stuff. And that stuff you see in cults like Jehovah's Witness, which I will call a cult, sorry. Uh, and you see it in a lot of weird New Age cults. And you, and once you open your mind to it and see it, you can realize, oh, cults don't need a religious element. And that's where you can start to see that certain movements like Ayn Rand's objectivism is an atheist cult movement built around Ayn Rand. And atheism itself built around people like Richard Dawkins and, uh, you know, Christopher Hitchens and Sam Harris and a whole bunch of others. And, I mean, or, or the people over at a group called Secular Talk, American Atheists. I don't know who you got here. I mean, again, these are clubs you can get, you, you buy memberships, you, you go to meetings, you get the publications. And they do have beliefs. One of their strange beliefs is they keep insisting they have no beliefs. Yeah. You will also see straight up in certain groups like the Freedom From Religion Foundation in here will just say, like, we're absolutely not a movement and, and we have no beliefs. And then they'll have statements of what their beliefs are and what they're doing as a movement. Yeah. <laughs> and you're laughing, but I'm like, there's almost something, I mean, psychologically or spiritually, that's very clever. I mean, they look right at you and say, we have no beliefs and we're not a movement. They yeah. chant in unison. They chant in unison. We have no beliefs. We're not yeah. in movement. And I mean, if you think of it as soon as you define your sort of belief as an absence of belief, uh, which is like what many atheists do. It's like just sort of takes away like any like epistemic like responsibility of having to defend your worldview. So you can just always take the default position, like you know, allow the other person to provide the evidence, not you. Which I mean is totally like, like not a, not not actually like good engagement in my view. It's not even not good engagement. It's it's I'm going to say it. Having been an atheist, okay, and uh, you know if you look at our site and you look at what we do, I know some Christians like cringe and they freeze and they're like, "Did he say that really?" Um, uh, in fact, you should warn your readers. They they might not like our content. Um, we're we're very engaged in the vulgar culture, the current. Yeah you know, what I call the current culture. We're actually, we don't say so openly, but we're especially targeting young men because we think young men are the ones who need us the most and who need to get out of this horrible, insipid. Mate, there's nothing more that will box your mind in and make you unable to think clearly more than atheism will. Uh, and yeah. I don't know how to explain that to you except having been one for so long. I mean, I imagine my story sounds different from some of your sto the stories you've heard because I never, never had the big, uh, you know, and not everybody does, but like the big reveal moment. One day I was reading the Bible or, you know, Jesus came to me or the, the, the Spirit suddenly filled me. No such experience. In fact, I yeah. had read the Bible, and since I did not, I truly did not see any reason why you would believe there was a God. I literally like, why is it, this book isn't even very good? And I know that disturbs some Christians to hear, but really, I read the New Testament and I, I found Jesus in particular bizarre. Yeah. And arbitrary and scary and not particularly inspiring. Yeah. And, you know, I've heard, I've had atheists say those things to me now today, like that's going to offend me somehow. I'm like, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. I used to feel that way too. Yeah. Which at least like like a lot of uh, atheists today are saying like that Jesus didn't exist and that sort of thing. <laughs> oh, and I was never that dumb. Yeah. I was never dumb enough to think Jesus, the person, the carpenter from Nazareth, didn't exist. I, I was never that dumb. I assumed I, I you know I pretty much was like well you know he's like Robin Hood who may or may not have existed. He's like King Arthur who may or may not have existed. You know stuff has come up 
you know, the legend got added to over time. Uh, plus, I would be like, well, well, plus just look, you know, there were alternate Gospels. I, I had seen and read the Gnostic Gospels and the Nag Hammadi stuff. And yeah. like, I, I, I saw no reason why you'd take the Bible that seriously, to be honest. Um, and that's just where I was. Yeah. So um, what's like changed the mind about the Bible? Like, I mean, how do, how do you view it now? In uh, How do I view in, the Bible? Yeah, like, how would you... So obviously you didn't have a very high view of it then. Um, no, I didn't. That cool. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm much more impressed with it now. <laughs> uh, uh, and, and Well, I mean, there's so many ways to answer this, but let, let's just take it chronologically. Um, uh, my, my, my transition was first, I'm just not an atheist because atheists are clearly crazy. Yeah. Um, was my conclusion, uh, at least when they get together in groups. And actually, my conclusion was if atheists are, are crazy when they get together in groups, how could atheism possibly be a survival strategy? Whereas religion, you know, not just the Christian religion, but religion and spirituality generally have always been around. And then atheists show up and they seem insane. Again, I, I just said, don't call me an atheist. I don't know what I am. And I began, you know, pondering the God question again, and I began actively seeking evidence that there was a God, or at least some kind of higher spiritual power. Yeah. And it was interesting, because I don't know why, for whatever reason, it just, perhaps because I'd read a number of Christian apologetics books over the years, and no Christian had ever convinced me, it, I just started looking in the oddest places, you know, and trying to come up with my own. Like, you wouldn't believe it, but I was reading a book called The Singularity is Near by Ray Kurzweil, which started that whole singularity fad. And I'm just reading it, and there was this chart in there that he had showing certain ways about how what he called, how he defined intelligence was in the universe, and you could tell the universe was constantly producing more intelligence mm -hmm. and had been for a really long time. And I don't know, I'm just looking at that, and I got a snap, and I said, that can't be an accident. It just can't be, right? If intelligence emerges from the cosmic Big Bang, if it, it doesn't just emerge, but it, it, it consistently emerges and continues to, I mean, I don't know, I, I'm not even sure I would go back to that book and look at that passage, and I would, like, I would still believe it, because like a lot of charts like that, it's, you know, you don't know if his methodology or thinking was sound, but I was looking at that, and that was the first moment I had. I said, if that's true, there has to be a God. And, and that, huh? That convinced yeah. you. Well, I said, there has to be a God. There just does. Yeah. That doesn't happen by accident. And then I started looking at other things. And I also would talk to religious people and say, well, why do you believe? And it was surprising. I could never get the answer I wanted out of anybody. So, but maybe that just fits my own personality, right? Because anytime you explain something to me, and this is, I mean, it's still true of me today at my current age, 51. But since childhood, every time you would say something to me, my instinct is to figure out why you might be wrong. I mean, yeah. it's just like a tick. My, my mind automatically does it, no matter what you say. Why might he be wrong? Why might he be mistaken? Why might he be lying? Why might he be? That's like my instant test. And so I almost think with a personality like me, and there are other personalities like that, you know, contrarian by nature, always want to test, always want to argue. Um, I think what I needed is to start focusing on why a godless universe doesn't make sense in the first place. Because, by the way, I can let you know now, especially after arguing with atheists and doing research the last couple of years, atheism really makes no sense whatsoever. It, 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 I don't know how a rational mind can stay atheist and not crack up. So, uh, so then on, the, on that note, then what would be your sort of uh, knockdown argument that you would give to atheists? Um, obviously, you mentioned that information one. Uh, but if atheism doesn't make sense, in what terms doesn't, on what grounds would you argue that? Well, 
I can't make a, a one sentence case for it. I don't have a knockdown argument. It's just yeah. like the positive arguments, the negative arguments, they become cumulative, right? But you do start making a list. If you start making a list of all the things that you believe as an atheist, that pretty much only an atheist believes, the, lo the list starts getting longer and longer and longer. Um, you know, from the basic, you know, does something come from nothing? Yeah. Does order, does order spontaneously, uh, you know, does order just spontaneously happening happen? Th does order keep happening? Why does order keep happening? Uh, so like the laws bigger, of like the bigger case, not just like the yeah, right. right, the laws of physics, you believe in those, right? Yeah. And oh, Here's where some people go, well, where do the laws of physics come from? That's not the way I put it. I say, why do the laws of physics keep going the way they're going? And why don't they change? Why do the laws of probability keep doing that? And the atheist will say, what? Keep doing what? I'm saying, why are the laws of probability operating and why do they operate the way do they do? Why do they keep doing that? Why does that happen? And it's those why questions like that that start to gnaw at you. you yeah. Keep Going and because because the list keeps going. Do you 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 believe there's no life after death? Do you have evidence for that? Um, you believe God is a delusion. Do you have evidence for that? I think there's a God. Am I insane? You know. Yeah. Uh, it's the, like I said, there is no knockdown drag out, I, I, but but or a knockdown punch. Uh, but at the same time, I've even found that. And this is what stunned me, right? And I think if you've, for example, if you've seen Frank Turek's work and Hugh Ross and a few others, you know there's plenty of scientific support for the for the yeah. theist position. Um, now, I, I I am sometimes critical of people like Frank Ro uh, like Ross or Frank Turek or those only because I think they too quickly jump from like. Oh, uh, okay. There's this digital physics theory of the universe. You familiar with it? The digital physics? Not really. Maybe. Oh well, this is this is worth knowing, even especially if you get somebody who's interested in science. Yeah. Um, I, I'll give you a list of areas in, in in science where there's there's definite evidence for God. We should stop saying you can't use science. Um, that's that's not necessarily true. The Big Bang is actually evidence for God. And, and Christians should say that openly. It is evidence for God. It may not prove it to you, but it's evidence. The cosmological constant, which I'm sure you've heard of, is also yeah. evidence. Yeah. Kalam uh, the Kalam mm -hmm. cosmological arguments. Yeah. Right. Actually, Personal. I don't. I don't like the Kalam argument myself, but yeah, sure, the Kalam argument. Um, yeah. But I mean, the Big Bang itself and the cosmological constant is this uh, is. To give it real short, but I mean, I've had multiple physicists personally affirm this for me, right? So I'm not talking out. Basically, when the, you look at all the laws of physics and, and, and how the op universe operates on them, they are fine-tuned to a point where if any one of the physical constants of like gravity and things like that fluctuated even a little, the entire universe would just dissolve into chaos. It would be unintelligible. Yeah. Huh? argument from fine-tuning yeah yes the argument from fine-tuning uh, yeah. well the argument from uh, uh, quant digital physics theory of the universe I can send you stuff on it if you like but this is contemporary science it is not by Christians per se it is mainstream it is being taught in regular university physics classes the digital physics theory of the universe holds that you know and, and it's a quantum theory quantum mechanics thing but it holds that the entire universe operates like a simulation, like a video game simulation. Uh, and they, they didn't call it a simulation, but even though the, calling it a simulation is a weird thing to say since it's reality, but that reality is operating exactly like a simulation up to the point where if, if something's not observed, it's not physically there. It's just stored in like Hilbert space or something. It's not really there. This is, again, that sounds weird, but this is contemporary physics. Stuff's not there if you're not looking at it. If it's not being observed, it's not there. And the digital physics theory of the universe holds that this can only work if something intelligent is running all of it. 
And as soon as you accept that something intelligent is running all of it, even quantum physics suddenly snaps into focus and looks in, looks sensible. As weird as quantum physics is, if you assume an independent, omniscient, omnipotent observer, all of quantum physics suddenly seems less weird. Um, but I mean, the point is, the, like Neil Tyson, the mediocre astronomer guy, you know, mediocre. was at a presentation where they talked about the digital physics theory of the universe, and he said, you know what, this is probably true. It's what it looks like to me, this theory is true. Well, if that theory is true, something intelligent is running every single atom of the universe. They seem to afraid, be afraid to use the word God there, but there's no other, you know, I mean, I guess you could think that it's space aliens running a super advanced simulation, but there's a point where they're just question begging. Um, also, a lot of the data in near-death experience, very interesting, very fascinating. The bottom line is we got markers for God all over the place even in science. Uh, the problem with using science for to prove anything, of course, is that science can always be overturned, mm. which is, of course, why if you're, if, you're, if you're doing apologetics or anything else, you don't want to lean too hard on the science because, you know, next week, I don't know, someone will come out and say, well, look, I debunked quantum mechanics, and there, your proof's gone because they changed the science. Yeah. So your, your, your classical evidence is, work, is, is more worth it, but what I keep finding, and I have gotten through to a few people like this, is like, look, here, I got like five, six areas of science with big stuff in them that points right to God, an afterlife, or a soul, and you won't even look at that evidence. And I've seen that with atheists, too. They won't look at the evidence. They won't even look at scientific evidence, even though they say it's, they, they're into science. Yeah. And, and all that got me to realizing, no, this atheism thing... Previous generations, because again, I'm old enough to remember it, there always were atheists around, and as long as they weren't being jerks, nobody cared that much, right? Um, but this, this, this milieu is out here now that, 